Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Uh, thank you for joining us for the 2022 edition of Expo Chicago, the International Exposition of Contemporary and Modern Art. I'm Kate sears Patowski, Director of Programming, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Dialogues, presented in partnership with the School of the Art of Institute of Chicago. Dialogues offers panel discussions, conversations, and provocative artistic discourse with leading artists, curators, designers, and arts professionals on current issues that engage them. The works of visual artist Devin Shimayama explore depictions of black, queer, male body in paintings that combine fur, feathers, glitter, and costume jewels to bring dimensionality to his surfaces. Devin is joined in conversation with Nate Freeman, art columnist for Vanity Fair and co-host of Nota Bene, to explore the magical auras that appear in his works, pieces that are both celebratory and complex in their depictions of queer black American culture. Devin's solo exhibition, A Counterfeit Gift Wrapped in Fire, opens tomorrow night at Kavi Gupta. This discussion will be immediately followed by a book signing with Devin in the Soho House Snug, Right over here, please join me in welcoming our panelists. All right, Devin, this is such a pleasure. You know, I wanted to ask you about the theme of rebirth. You know, you said that that is, you know, the sort of main thrust of the show that opens up uh, tomorrow. And what do you mean by rebirth? And, and you mentioned authentic rebirth versus, you know, sort of, uh, superficial rebirth, and what's the difference between those two things? Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, I so a counterfeit gift wrapped in fire. The title of the show, um, to me, kind of encapsulates some or embodies some of that uh, dealing with rebirth and thinking about um, a counterfeit gift wrapped in fire. For me, kind of means this. Uh, artificial facade that I kind of uh, feel like a lot of people can relate to, that sort of thing where you might ask, how's it going or how are you doing? And then you, you respond that you're fine, but you're mm. not necessarily, uh, you might be wrangling with a multitude of emotions, a lot of different uh, darker things underlying that. Um, and so it's, uh, for, for me, I think uh, that rebirth is really Significant. It can happen in small ways. It can be, um, you know, starting anew. The the show is kind of like bookended by, uh, or not bookended. It starts with um, this one sculpture uh, and then ends with another sculpture that's very mm -hmm. similar. And it, it's these um, shoes that dangle over these wires. And for me, they both kind of deal with uh, memorialization, death in this way, but um, then you enter into the space and you are confronted with the death tarot painting, which uh, for me deals with rebirth and has a lot to do with um, new beginnings. It's an opportunity, it's the end of one chapter and into a new, uh, new lived experience, which can be really exciting, really terrifying, really scary. And so I think um, for me, it, that those types of rebirths of uh, small little magical moments can be really invigorating, really exciting. And yeah, that's kind of a general overview of like my thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think you also mentioned in the press release like Rihanna's like sort of rebirth as, you know, she's kind of stopped making music and now she's a billionaire, you know. Uh, you know just, I mean, what made you think of Rihanna just like sort of in that? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny. The I've made a lot of paintings over the years with uh, either references to pop culture, music, specifically R&B artists, uh, pop music as well. But, um, you know, I, I look at a lot of, I, I listen to a lot of music in the studio. It influences me directly. Popular culture does certainly. And I'm really invested in the ways in which uh, I have an affinity for as a, you know, when I was a young little kid, like running, listening to what my mom would listen to. And um, I really be became enamored with this, uh, the female pop diva. And um, it's sort of, you know, as a queer young person growing up surrounded by women, that was a uh, like safe space for me. Those people raised me, they made me who I am, made me feel safe. Um, 
And I think for me, the female pop diva is like this thing to be celebrated and I, you know, I champion them so much and um, sometimes I stand by them even when they're, you know, messing up. Mm. I, I still love Nicki Minaj, <laughs> who is a mess. <laughs> but, um, and, you know, I think that that, uh, you know, in the death tarot card painting that I have, you can see at the bottom there's Rihanna's hand kind of emerging from the ground. Um, and I think about the death of her music career and this desire that people want more from her in this capacity, but she's delivering in so many other different ways and mm -hmm. she's just living her life and minding her business. She's having a baby. She's um, becoming a billionaire. She's running, you know. So it was the death of one era. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe she'll release music again um, and that'll be a new a rebirth of her through a new context of having been away for so long, taken that time, uh, redirected her career, her image, um, you know, even thinking of her as a performer. Um, but she, you know, I think that that's, uh, yeah, I think that that type of uh, pop divadom appears in my work a ton. So yeah. you can find Rihanna's, like, fingers and stuff <laughs> in old paintings of mine. All, all, there's Aaliyah all over the place. It's great. I love right. it. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, in this show you have sort of portraits that are actually self-portraits mm -hmm. of you as Aaliyah, as, as Left Eye, as Ronnie Spector, right? And that, that plays into the same thing, right? It's just like your yeah. reverence for the female pop icon. Um, but there are also these sort of mythological tropes that, that are present in the show. And I think that's kind of a, a new thing for, for you and for your work. And why did you want to reach back into you know, Greek mythology to be able to tell the story that you wanted to tell with this show that opens tomorrow? Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, right, more recently I've been looking a little bit more into specifically, uh, I've done a lot of paintings dealing with Greek mythology or referencing that in the past. And then mm -hmm. I've sort of, uh, in more recent years, been looking more into things like uh, learning about chakra, learning about alternative healing practices, um, especially during the pandemic. That was something that I uh, really became a little bit more invested in. I started looking into other types of mysticisms and, um, and also thinking a lot about uh, transmutation, um, transformation, and, uh, and I think tarot was one of the sort of starting points where I started to think about um, ways in which I can unpack or look to something else that will help me understand better certain decisions that I'm making or help as a guide. Um, and I think that for me, a lot of that uh, comes out of, you know, I was raised in a Baptist Christian household. And so a lot of these things, astrology, all of that um, is very popular right now, especially with, um, you know, my generation and younger. It's uh, very popular. Yeah. And so I did not grow up with that around me in that uh -huh. way. And so it's been something that I've been exploring and um, finding ways to kind of like hybridize or cross over or even dig into them deeper and see that there are through lines and connections to things that I was raised with. And, and so for me, it's, um, you know, the, all this type of work is, is, is kind of like a, a way for me to better understand myself, allow myself to sort of research and explore um, different belief systems or uh, even religions or whatever, magic, mysticism, all of that. I'm, I'm learning from a friend of mine a lot about Yoruba and, um, and different types of deities through that. And so it's just been really exciting and enriching. And it also has led me to understand the history of like, um, my own ancestry in a lot of ways being uh, Caribbean, of Caribbean descent. And so that's, it's just been really interesting and engaging. I love having a kind of point of research that I use as a way to generate imagery or ideas. And so, yeah, that's just what I've been doing in this show. And it's a little more varied than other bodies mm -hmm. of work that I've done, but I think I like that kind of crossover. And so, yeah, you mentioned tarot, the tarot cards, you said the death card, the tarot's all through this new body of work, and you just came to that in, in recently, right? You, you, it wasn't like a sort of long, lifelong obsession. What, what about tarot made you, you know, uh, want to incorporate it into your work? What, what really fascinated you about it? I think, you know, I, you can look at a lot of different... Uh, tarot doesn't have to just be... There's oracle decks, and then there's traditional mm -hmm. certain other... Types of decks. I don't and, know anything about um, tarot. So. I, what I really love about it is that I've I've gotten readings done, and you know many of them are kind of nonsense, and some of them are really exciting, and I kind of latch on to what feels right. Um, mm -hmm. I've you know there's so many different ways to read the cards. I, what I love about it is that there's um, 
these illustrations that have so much symbolism embedded in them. And so I remember the first thing that I did is I bought this Black Power tarot deck and I loved the, the illustrations on it had a bunch of like, um, like the Hanged Man card had Tupac hanging upside down and then, uh, <laughs> you know, all different types of like, I think Viola Davis is on one of the cards. I forget what she Amazing. is. She might be the high priestess, <laughs> which she should be. Um, but I, yeah, I love uh, that, you know, these images are imbued with so many different um, there's so many different iterations of them. Artists have taken them on historically. You can find tarot card compositions by Dali and so many other people. And so I really wanted to um, insert my, my own interpretation of that and translate some of these things into my own work. And so I think um, what's really nice is that I'm looking at uh, one tarot card, for example, is the star. Uh, what's, has, the, what's the star? So the star tarot card has... Um, you know, it's like a, traditionally it's a woman who's nude and she's pouring water from one vessel into like a body of water. One of her feet is in water and the other water that she has is spilling onto the ground, um, enriching the ground. So there's all these little meanings in all of these um, small moments, but then behind there is a constellation of stars in the sky and they correlate to the seven chakras in your body. And so there's things like that that I think are really interesting that there's these overlaps with different types of um, with divination, with uh, belief systems, uh, mysticism, magic, all of these things have connections. And I, I think that that's, uh, to me, it's more evidence that there is some kind of greater power or something that's not tangible um, mm -hmm. or palpable that we can access through different modes of thinking um, or working through it th through these different systems. And I think that's what's really exciting. So for me as an artist, I think that, um, especially as a painter, I think so much about how painting is magic. It's spell casting. I think poetry is spell casting. It's spelling for a reason, literally. And so I think that, you know, it's sort of manifesting in a lot of different ways. So, yeah. Mm. I want to take a step back and just ask, you know, when did you want to do this? When did you first have the, the, the sort of inkling that you were going to be an artist? What, uh, just take us through the very, very beginning. Um, when I was a little kid, my mom immediately, I grew up an only child. Um, mm -hmm. My mom had me really young. She was 16, so I grew up with my grandparents as well in the household and my mother's siblings as well. And so um, just ever since I was really little, they, they kind of just let me do whatever I naturally had an inclination or an interest in. And so I actually grew up doing a lot. I drew a lot. Um, and so when I got about... 13, I think I was about 13, um, my mom sought out uh, figure drawing classes and things like that. I grew up in Philly. Um, mm -hmm. So I was able to take like nude figure drawing classes at a university nearby, which was really fortunate. I had like to get a note and everything. And I remember being like, I can't believe I'm looking at like naked people like this. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, and, and, but it was really amazing because I had this opportunity. So I've been drawing the figure since I was really little mm -hmm. in a meticulous way. And, um, but I also grew up playing classical music. I grew up playing uh, violin and vi viola, mostly. I had a cousin who taught me. She was in the Philharmonic. She had gone to Yale for um, music. And I, so I did both. And I didn't know what I was going to go to college for, actually, until I got to that point. And then I was like, OK, I guess yeah, to choose. pick. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> they both require so much dedication. There was no way I was going to do both. But um, yeah, so I, I've just always done it. But I, I also was raised. Um, uh, in a household where, like, my mother would have people, uh, her friends, um, some of them were artists and in different capacities. And um, one of them she dated is a trans man. His name is Shamar. And he really, um, I don't know, he really, really taught me how to uh, render things, uh, chiaroscuro, lighting, all these different things as a kid, as a little kid. That's so I, I was really fortunate to be surrounded by so much of that. Mm -hmm. And he still makes amazing paintings to this day, paintings and drawings. Mm -hmm. And so you went to Penn State mm -hmm. and then on to Yale. What was your experience at, at Yale like? You know, it's like kind of the top, top uh, in terms of just like, you know, grad programs. Like, what, what was your experience yeah. there like? And so how did that sort of get you going on your career where you are now? Yeah, a lot of people ask me about Yale. It's a funny thing. <laughs> Sorry to no, be a cliche. No, 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 it's, it's, no, it's fine. I mean, it's a very different place now, I'm sure, than when I was there. I graduated in 2014. Um, and... It was intense. I was 22 when I started. I was like, this, I think I was the youngest person in my class, if not the second youngest, something like that. And mm -hmm. um, 
I was, you know, I got there and I was like, I can't even believe, I didn't get into other schools. So I was like, when I got into Yale, I was like, that's very strange, you know. And then I arrive and everybody else, some of them had already had careers a little bit before and are using grad school as an opportunity to just like, take a break and have a studio or whatever, <laughs> you know, and, um, and many of the other people had gone to programs like RISD or um, SAIC, for example, you know, and I went to Penn State, which is not the most, like, known for being an art right. school at all. Um, they have a football team here, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> football and, like, drinking a lot, and then, unfortunately, the whole other well, thing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, so, <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I had a really... I had to play catch up kind of. And I was like a kid, I feel like now in retrospect, I'm like, oh my God, I was mm -hmm. 22. I was such a baby. I had no idea what, how to be an artist or any of that. And it was just an exponential learning curve. And, um, and I felt like I just fumbled my way through and got knocked around and then somehow like, um, you know, I graduated and then immediately started teaching, which was also crazy. So yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I've kind of always just taken a big leap and, figured it out as I go, and it's so far <laughs> worked out okay, I think. <laughs> um, I mean, how do you balance the, the, you know, so you're a professor at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Yeah. How, do you, how do you balance the teaching and studio time? Like, like I mean, this is, uh, you know, something that me, mo, a lot of artists have to sort of balance. I mean, mm -hmm. but now that you've been teaching for, what, six, seven years? Uh, yeah, this is my eighth year. Eighth year, yeah, yeah, yeah it's amazing. I mean, it's it just, is it just a lifestyle that you can just sort of, you know, go back and forth? Um, it... Uh, it's weird, they kind of, those two careers feed each other. Being a full-time artist is mm -hmm. the reason why I'm able to teach um, and continue to, I have to go through these reviews, of course, like that are looking at my activity and so I'm active and so that's really nice um, and I'm really fortunate to be so doing so and yeah. it's really nice to also be able to, um, you know, Carnegie Mellon doesn't have the most, I mean, we've become a much more uh, diverse in terms of faculty and student body um, program since me being there, but when I arrived, I was the only black faculty member. Wow. Um, and I was, you know, younger than some of the other faculty members' kids. Mm. So it was like a very unusual experience moving to a city I'd never been to, um, being 24 at the time, teaching full time. Wow. And my students are like 21. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it, you know, I <laughs> like wanting to party and I'm younger than all the grad students. <laughs> so it was very socially bizarre, but I, I, um, I made it through. Uh, it's just, they sort of, it's really inspiring. I mean, Carnegie Mellon's an interdisciplinary program, truly, it really is. Um, so it's, um, we say it's medium agnostic and you reach for the medium that fits the idea best. And, um, and I really believe in that and it's really expanded my own practice. I've learned so much from my students who think so differently and approach materiality differently. Um, and they have, you know, I, they, they're just so exciting and weird, weird. <laughs> That's great. It's great. That's I love great. it. Yeah. Um, and so, like, in those years after Yale, like, like, was it hard to sort of get traction going, to get shows? Like, how did you sort of just, like, get your, yourself out there, you know, in the first yeah. few years? I never moved to New York. Um, yeah. Pretty much everybody else that I knew moved to like New York or LA. Um, you just, you meant, went to Pittsburgh because you got a job there? Yeah, because you know. I was like, that seems a lot more stable mm -hmm. than um, moving to, New I just didn't understand how, I was like, I still don't get how someone's an artist and like <laughs> makes money. So, um, and I, yeah, I moved there and what ended up happening was, is I just like was able to have a clear headspace and I had a studio that the um, school provided me, right. which was really nice. So, I and also I had the support from the the school to make the time to make work and figure that out. So I was sending a lot of work um, into different publications, group shows, uh, auctions, things like that. I would just send it out and. Um, eventually, I remember there was a gallerist that I used to work with in LA had seen a work of mine in a, he bought it, it was like a print mm -hmm. in, a, um, in an auction that I donated the work to that uh, the proceeds went towards, um, I believe it was towards uh, queer youth and um, he offered me a show. I did the show in LA and then it got a review in the LA Times and it was like this huge deal for me and I couldn't believe Amazing. it. And, um, and from then on, it just sort of, I started doing the art fair circuit and, um, and then sort of bouncing around. And I, what I did was I just kept putting myself out there a lot. And also, right when I graduated from grad school, social media really changed. Yeah, and I think it was that, right, right like, around then. I think, I don't know how old Instagram is, but I remember I had just gotten it like when I went to grad school and that, um, so I'm, I'm sure like a lot of artists are now just coming up on that's sort of the way in which they can generate 
or even um, you know make a lot of other galleries and things like that known globally. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, like, do you need to move to New York or LA if you can just put your stuff out on Instagram? I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it just seems like it's definitely working for you. I mean, um, and so. You, you, you've had like a long relationship with, with Kavi Gupta, the your gallery here in Chicago. Uh, I want to ask about the show in 2019 uh, because it was sort of themed around this house that you bought in Pittsburgh um, and the idea of home ownership um, and the idea of domesticity. And, and I found that really fascinating. And so, so what was your approach to going into that show? Was it really just you were thinking about the fact that you bought this house and, you know, what that meant sort of to you and to just, you know, in general? Yeah, I, um, m most of my work comes out of a place of uh, deep personal curiosity and also lived experience. And so at that time, mm. I had just bought a house and I was like, I can't believe I'm doing this thing that... Um, my mom and her, like my aunt just bought a house for the first time and my grandmom had just finished paying off her house. And I, um, so for me, it was this thing that I was very aware of that felt very adult. Like I was like, this is the most adult thing that I, I'll ever do. And, you know, and I think I still think that's kind of true. And I, um, yeah, so for me, I, I bought this house. It was a, um, like an old house it's from the 20s i think and um it fumbled through it there's a lot of there were a lot of issues with the house that i didn't know um when like i what? first bought it like, i had to oh my god we had, to, we had to, it wasn't it didn't look like it, it looked <laughs> fixed um and then i and then like moved in now there's like black mold and like um and then it's fine um and then and then that, we had to put a could French, be really unhealthy yeah and then uh it's it's gone, but um, but there, and, you know, there's like uh, we had to put a French drain in the basement. So because Pittsburgh basements are, it's a whole thing. It's a thing. Okay. It's I don't a, know anything. It's about hard the thing. to explain, but they're very low. Like it's not a usable basement, and usually there's like a weird toilet just down there. Okay. Um, yeah, because it's a coal mining place, so people used to come right, in right. through an entrance that goes directly down into the basement. And so I still have one of those doors, wow. and then there will be like a toilet there that, and like usually a shower um, for whoever would be working in the, the mine would like shower off um, so there's just a lot of little weird things cracks in the foundation and so a lot of learning and fixing up the house and caring for it and tending to it but then also there was this kind of like spiritual charged energy in the attic specifically and um, I remember when, when like first living there for a long time there used to be there's this fan in the attic that um, is like an exhaust fan that blows air out and um, I had unplugged it because it was making noise and then it would still like for some reason be going off like I would hear it when I would take my dogs outside um, to go potty in the yard and I'd go up there and then it would just be running again but unplugged it was very <laughs> strange and it stressed me out and I really don't like interactions with spirits um, even Who though does? I am very spiritual it just was not for me like I didn't like it so I had talked to um, you know a, a friend of mine who I actually um, had uh, coordinated this event uh, she's a poet and she also is a, a um, she does a lot of divination and, um, mm. and things like that and so she gave me a lot of advice on how to sort of uh, approach the spirit, um, you know, using sage and um, actually approaching them with care and love and, um, and openness in this way. And then it sort of stopped after a while. I mean, it changed. She, the, the spirit stopped um, being in the attic and they would now like knock my keys at the end of the stairs, not in a mean way, but it felt more like a <laughs> hi. Um, and, but yeah, I always felt like it was connected to this, um, I did deeper research into my home and uh, there was a fire that had happened there in the attic um, in the 20s. And there's very little information about it, but it felt like uh, some energy was still stuck in there from that. Mm -hmm. And so how did you sort of apply this pretty remarkable story about this house that you bought? Mm -hmm. Like you know, the divination, the, the, the spirit knocking. How did you apply that to the show in 2019? And what, what, you know, how did the, the show reflect that? I actually made a painting of the moment of me connecting with that spirit. Um, my One of my dogs would always go up with me to the attic whenever I went into that room. Um, and you can see there's, it's called Smoke and Sage is the name of the painting. And it's a painting of me in the attic and it's this wood. So it's me kind of connecting and conflating two different times at the same time. So it's the fire happening in the attic and it's me saging it. Um, but you can't really tell if I've started the fire 
if I'm getting rid of it, if I'm even aware of it. And, um, and so that was the one painting that I had made that was like most directly tethered to it. But then there's also paintings in that show that show my grandmother um, blessing the home. She, everywhere I've ever moved, she always comes with um, her holy oil and she does a prayer and she blesses the home and she blesses me and living in that space. And that's always really important to her and also to me. Um, and Amazing. there's another painting of me tending to my yard, things that I had never dealt with um, mowing a big lawn. I'm from Philly, so we don't have a lot of grass. So, you know, it's just very, it's very different. A a learning curve for sure. Mm -hmm. And when you were making these works in 2019, did you think that you would spend a very large chunk of 2020 just staying in this house? Um, Like, (laughs) I mean, we all had to deal with like lockdowns and, and, you know, different ways, but it's just the idea of what the home was, I think shifted for a lot of people. And like, did you feel differently about the house? And, like, how did you sort of adjust your practice to staying in Pittsburgh, staying inside? Yeah, so I didn't have a studio f- because of that, because I my studio was on campus where I teach, um, and campus shut down really mm-hmm. tight, so there was yep. no access at all. So I, um, you know, immediately thought, I don't want to paint in my house, because I paint with oil, and that has a lot of different chemicals, and right. um, it's not great to be breathing that in with the dogs in the, the house dogs, and yeah. all of that. So what, what dogs do you have, by the way? I have two Cavalier King Charles Spaniels named River and Bowie, and they are oh, incredible. really like just the <laughs> cutest, stupidest, like fat little chunks. Amazing. But I, yeah, but I, um, yeah, but what I did was is I kind of shifted my practice towards drawing. I um, also shifted my practice towards uh, more soft sculpture, I guess you could say. These hoodies that I would um, sew and stitch and uh, glue and adhere all of these different types of materials like um, silk flowers. You know, this was also during a time where uh, Black Lives Matter was really peaking. So I think of that type of work that I was doing at home as being a time of deep reflection and thinking about um, making these works as spontaneous memorials, paying homage to these, uh, and and, and also using it as a way for me to like have catharsis and and sit with a lot of that, um, the weight of that these complicated feelings, you know, people are posting black squares on Instagram thinking that's like changing anything. It's like, so, and trying to deal with anger, but also saying I'm fine, you know, that's mm. also a counterfeit gift wrapped right. in fire. So it's like, um, you know, wrangling with all of those things. I spent a lot of time building um, tighter and more um, important and integral friendships with uh, the very few friends that I really keep and hold close and dear to me. And from that has generated a lot of different things in my work. It's changed a lot because of those relationships. And, um, and I've grown a lot through a lot of that. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, with the show that, that, that it opens tomorrow, uh, I, I guess, how could you mark like the, the shift from the show in 2017 and then now, I mean, you're still sort of, you know, portraying, you know, the Bonnie, queer Bonnie is like, and you're you're doing so in this joyful, wonderful, you know, uh, just exuberant way, and I, it's they're striking, they're so beautiful and 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 uh, just eye catching. But but I want to know what's shifted in the last three years from from those paintings that were sort of about domesticity in the house to these paintings, which are like a lot of really striking portraits. Um, I will say I read a lot more. Okay. Um, And I read a lot more poetry. Uh, Mostly I read uh, poetry, science fiction, and epic fantasy. A lot of that influences my work, um, and you can probably see that. I do a lot of, um, I'm I'm allowing myself a lot more freedom with being a little more playful and incorporating a lot of the references and things that I just enjoy that I think are kind of um, maybe a little lighter, but then Mm -hmm. uh, taking them as seriously as I actually do. Uh, in this, I think there was a painting uh, that's actually in the fair of um, Aaliyah's character in Queen of the Damned, Queen mm-hmm. Akasha. And so, you know, I'm allowing myself to really just um, embrace all of my interest and in, in love for um, pop culture, for anime, for, um, you know, weird fantasy, speculative fiction, all of those things. So I'm giving myself permission to really just like celebrate all of that and think about these things as, um, you know, something that's worth actually uh, making work about and not feeling a little embarrassed. I feel like a lot of people think that some things are maybe silly or superfluous and don't actually matter or aren't important or interesting, but 
a lot of that stuff really, I think I want to know what people are really invested in and what they do outside of their artistic practice, like, and see that kind of seep in. Yeah, totally. Over. Me too. I mean, is there any other examples, like, uh, just stuff that you have been reading that you want to just tell us, like, that's really influenced the show tomorrow? Like, Yeah, sure. Should... Well, one thing that's kind of funny um, <laughs> is that there are these two, um, there's these paintings that I've made that I also have, um, like when you first walk in, there's a huge wall vinyl, and then there's another wall vinyl um, next to another painting, and that painting specifically, uh, the wall vinyl is um, really layered uh, photo edit, like I've edited these screen grabs from um, Pursuit of Happiness, uh, right. the film, and so it's this final scene mm -hmm. um, in the movie that really fits with this painting where it's a man crying and it's two panels um, stacked and you can see him crying and then you can see him crying from another angle and I always um, think of that movie as really joyous and it's this um, it really embodies so much of like this feeling of uh, you know at the end he the, spoiler alert he gets the job and uh -huh. it's like you know it's this really emotional moment that changes his entire life and and that's a, a death and a rebirth that's occurring in it mm -hmm. and it happens right at the end and it's really emotional and it's Will Smith crying, and of course I, you know, I have these th things made, and I'm really like, oh, this is so great. Will Smith is going to win an Oscar, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I made these things, and then now he's, you know, did something else. But that's he did, okay. He did win the Oscar. Yes, though. <laughs> he did win the Oscar, and he did cry again, and mm -hmm. so there's a new image of him crying, and that's different. But I, yeah, but in that, I was really interested in these moments of like. Um, bringing in other interests of mine, like I, I watch a lot of movies. I love kind of sappy moments like that. I love um, anime and even overlaid on that is, um, and I, again, I talked about transformation and transmutation. There's um, an edit of Sailor Moon's eyes during her transformation sequences that occurs in the show where um, she basically goes through this very long sequence of dramatic spinning and twirling and, um, and then her clothes change and nobody recognizes her anymore. But like I love that that's um, you know she becomes powerful in that moment and um, and she becomes a new and she becomes a mystery and and um, and she's brave and bold and so different from how she is outside of that transformation so um, yeah I'm really for me it's like this is a new show new body of work that has a lot of risks that I'm taking that maybe mm. might not be as obvious to everybody else but for me it feels really different and exciting yeah from from what I can gather from looking at the works you know we talked about how the home that you have in Pittsburgh was sort of the setting for the show in 2019, and you've done shows that are sort of really based in the barber shop as like an idea and also as a physical place. There isn't really like a setting for this show, is there? It's kind of more amorphous. No. Yeah. yeah, and it, that was that was like uh, you know that was you sort of did that on purpose. You wanted to draw from like a lot of different places and sort of yeah, um, yeah. There's no territory. setting for the show, so like uh, you know, and yeah, in pre you're right. In previous bodies of work, there's sort of a place specifically that I'm thinking about. This, I'm more so thinking about a condition of being, and so I, I can't quite locate that in a specific nameable place necessarily. And so everywhere is kind of in a kind of um, liminal space or in that kind of space that exists outside of physical space and time um, where a lot of these types of transformations exist, which is a lot, very, most often internal. Um, and similarly, in a lot of those transformation sequences that I'm even thinking about in cartoons or in even like Power Rangers when I was a kid, like those moments are um, these extended times that you know, it's like a 30 second to one minute long sequence that's occurring. And I remember being as a kid being like, are they just standing there twirling around and w their enemy is like waiting for them to change clothes, you know? And <laughs> then I realized later, I was like, no, these are these transformations that are occurring in an instant. And mm -hmm. it's this, it exists outside of this thing where time is this other nebulous, maybe, maybe, maybe in this other dimension, it's more palpable or something that you can latch onto and change and pull and push. And so I think about a lot of these paintings as existing kind of in that type of space. There's one painting that maybe was in here. Um, Which yeah. one was it? Uh, it has the butterfly wings. Mm -hmm. um, and that one, um, you can see there's this kind of like trippy spiral and the figure is holding this flower there. And I think of that as being that type of liminal kind of strange Transform transformation space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, you, this is your second solo show at, at the gallery, right? Yeah. And um, so how do you feel about the show opening 
right now in the middle of the, of the fair opening. It seems like it's a crazy time in Chicago and there's so much going on. I mean, is it fun to sort of have a part of the week? Like, you know, is it, uh, do you have a connection to Chicago? Have you spent a lot of time here? I haven't spent a ton of time here. My first time actually coming to Chicago was coming out here to, um, I think it was for the group show that I was in mm -hmm. uh, with Kavi Gupta a few years ago. And, um, and I, just, I really love the city. A really close friend of mine um, moved here also a couple of years ago, um, and they're a drag queen here, and they're, um, you know, like a, a, every time I come out, I am able to be immersed immediately into a network of friends and other people who are so welcoming and really wonderful, and people seem nicer here than they do in other cities, maybe. Yeah, I think, I think um, that's true. People yeah. are really nice. Yeah, that's and great. so opening during Expo is really exciting. I mean, there's four shows opening this week at Kavi Gupta and yeah. like, that's incredible and I uh -huh. love all of those artists work and it's like it's just so much fun to be able to see so much good work so many um, different ways of thinking and, and making and modes of making um, in each gallery it's just really yeah I, I don't know I'm in good company it's mm. great and and the you know there's gonna be a little book signing afterwards so you guys stick around. How did the book uh, come about? I mean, is this is this you know a, a new kind of project for you? So it's a catalog from my exhibition um, at uh, Kunstpalais Erlangen mm -hmm. in Germany, and that show, um, you know, I worked with the curator in making a book that was a little more substantial than just the images of the works that were in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and so at that museum, um, it's just. I, it's really amazing, and there are some images here, and you can see those arched hallways um, going down. It was a really beautiful space. I was able to in incorporate a lot of different types of work that I've made, um, or different bodies of work that I've made. Um, so it's, uh, the title of the book is actually on the side. It's called All the Rage, um, mm -hmm. which was the title of that exhibition. And this body of work that I've made in this uh, gallery show here at Kavi Gupta is a kind of a continuation of that work um, mm. in a lot of ways. I mean, it still plays into some of, pulls some of those pop culture references in. Um, there were a couple of tarot card paintings actually in that exhibition really? as well. Okay. So this um, book has works that I've made since, um, I think, all the way back to, I believe, 2017. Mm. So, um, and then it has a really, it has a nice interview in it. I was able to reach out to one of my favorite, um, you know, there, there's this, uh, there's a, writer that wrote um, a piece in there, but then there's also an excerpt from a book called M Archives, which is this like post-apocalyptic future um, compilation of essays um, about black women um, in, in the future. And it's just like this really, I don't know, it's just a, a really great uh, excerpt that I think relates to the work, relates to my way of thinking, um, the women that I think about a lot in my own life mm -hmm. and that I, I've surrounded myself with. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really, nice opportunity to have also show a lot of close-ups of the work so you get the texture, mm -hmm. the cover of the book, even the little details of the texture on the cover is like so specific. So it was fun working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I got a copy and I think it looks just fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I can't wait for everyone to see it. Um, so you have a lot going on currently. I, I, I think that you have work and shows where Albright Knox in Buffalo, uh, Center for Contemporary Art in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, where else? Uh, oh, the one, uh, the installation that's in here of the uh, rhinestone mm -hmm. telephone poles is at the Smithsonian in DC, the uh, Arts and Industries building, which that's is like the original Smithsonian building, which is like really, really incredible to be there. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that building very well. It's like, it's a beautiful, like the, the red brick building, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's amazing. Um, but you also have a lot coming up. Um, can you give me a sense of just sort of the projects that you're working on, shows that you're working on? I know you're going to have some work uh, that's part of the Front Triennial, mm -hmm. uh, which is just around the corner in, yeah. you know, so in that, Ohio. Yeah, so that work is going to be really fun because it, um, you know, I, uh, the, it'll be some of my more sculptural work, so works that are rooted in... Um, spontaneous memorial traditions and craft traditions that relate to that. So it'll be uh, like a hoodie that's um, completely adorned with silk flowers and embellishments and um, possibly a swing. It really, we're in talks about that. But what was really nice is I had a really wonderful studio visit with the team from 
um, from the front triennial, uh, and we ended. I think it was supposed to be like a half an hour or something, and we ended up talking for like two hours. Oh, and, that's great. Um, actually, longer than that. And um, but it was a great conversation, and then it really led to a lot of conversations about the importance of friendship in my practice, and um, now one of my best friends is going to be included with me in the triennial, um, who's a poet who actually wrote in my first museum catalog. So, yeah, it's just been really exciting. So That's I have that. so cool. Yeah. I mean, like, like, how often does that happen? Like, where you can be like, you know what, can I bring in this? this I didn't totally- even ask. <laughs> I just was, like, talking about them and how much their work and our friendship and working through the pandemic all of that time actually um, influenced my practice so much. And it, it almost felt like it just, it just made sense. And mm-hmm. they said, you know, let's try to make that happen if you'd be open to that. And I said, absolutely. I would love to reach out to her and, um, you know, and, and make that work. That's so cool. And I, yeah, I'm very much looking forward to front. I think it's going to be a really, really cool show. I mean, like the, the artist list looks amazing. And I know those guys are really, really, really smart. And um, I think that we should all check it out. So at this point, I think we are going to take a few questions from the audience. If anyone has any, let's see right over here. Start over here. Hold on, we have a microphone, I believe. Hi. Um, I have some questions about the tarot. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, I was looking at the temperance one, and I'm wondering if you are combining symbolism of different tarot cards and uh, if you have like a personal tarot practice and how that plays into that. Yeah, so um, yes, I am kind of, uh, you can tell in that, and so in the um, temperance tarot card, there traditionally you wouldn't see the water spilling back out from the cup. Um, so I'm, I'm playing a little bit with water bearers in general in a lot of my work. Um, there is another painting actually of my friend that I was just mentioning, Ricky Laurentis, who's an incredible poet. Um, and it's of her as an Aquarius, um, as a water bearer. An Aquarius is related to, goes back to Greek mythology, um, you know, looking at the figure of Ganymede, the most beautiful boy. And um, Ricky being this, uh, to, I've, I've seen Ricky go through their transition and, um, and really, I, I don't know, really has influenced my own understanding of transformation, both bodily and, but also mentally and emotionally. And, um, and really, to me, the water bearer um, and the spillage of that water is uh, a little bit of a play on that painting. So it's, it's kind of referencing a little bit of like um, thinking about Ganymede as that, uh, the cup bearer to the gods. And, um, and to me, the spilling of it is a sort of uh, reclaiming of agency for that figure who was, this is like a long story, sorry. But um, Ganymede was, uh, um, you know, taken by Zeus um, and then brought up as the uh, cup bearer to the gods. And um, for me, I always felt like there was no agency there. Hera got really pissed off about it, and she's always jealous, obviously. That's how she's depicted, which is, like, so wrong. She's so much more than that. Um, but I think uh, what was really important to me when painting anything about Ganymede or an Aquarius is that they have agency and that they're not just, um, you know, this character that actually has no voice. And the beauty, actually, um, that's discussed is not so much physical beauty always, but it can be beauty of the mind, and it seemed like um, they had really a beautiful intellectual relationship as well that was deep and more than just physical beauty or desire. So um, when there's like spillage that's happening and I'm playing so much with water and water bears and um, when that spillage is happening there, I'm thinking about it uh, being, it's, it's also not wine, it's water being poured back down. So I'm thinking a lot about um, giving back into the the well of resources that you're, that you've taken from. And so it's, um, so in that painting, it is a little bit different. So yes, you did notice a, a detail like that is, is out of place. Yeah. The ace, is this oh. the ace of wands? And also it looks like the hermit too. I'm wondering about. So I, that's the I, page I, of wands. Oh, the page. Oh, yeah. So the page of wands is, uh, I guess basically it would correlate to an irregular deck of cards, like a Jack, um, you know, and so uh, in that he's usually depicted as a young boy um, holding a wand that is taller than him, and it has no, it has like one leaf, and it, he's in a barren landscape. And as you go up to the queen, she, um, like the queen of wands, I think is a, li- a little bit more, um, you know, there's more things growing out of the wand, the wand is smaller in that one, and she's more in control. So, yeah, it's sort of, um, but there are differences there, because in that painting specifically, the, um, the landscape is actually lit, scattered with um, 
little salamanders and, and, uh, and it's raining and it shouldn't be raining in the desert, which is kind of this looming presence actually, cause that can be really dangerous in a desert. Um, so that's a change is that there's a, a moment of risk, but also a, an opportunity for replenishing the land again. Um, so there's an opportunity for growth that's happening. So it's either, it can sort of go one or one of two ways in that painting. So yeah, I am making slight changes that maybe change the symbolism of what the card originally is intending. All right, next question. I have kind of a fun question. Okay. Uh, if you could choose one artist who's passed away that you were in a duo show with, let's say, at a museum or a gallery in conversation with your work, um, who would you like to be in conversation with your work, another artist in history? That's a great question. Oh, that's hard. Um, but it is fun. I mean, there's a lot of people that I could think of. Um, um, Okay, I'm gonna go with Belka Sayon, I think, or or maybe I'll go with like maybe Barkley Hendricks. I feel like I mean maybe that's too recent. Maybe we're hoping for more like longer history, but maybe one of those two. I just feel like well, for one, I met Barkley. Um, oh, cool. Oh no, you know what? I'm I'm changing. Sorry. Um, I'm gonna go with Jack Whitten, <laughs> um, who I've also met, and he had the best sneakers on, and I <laughs> feel like shoes are so important. I just saw Jack Whitten. I almost fell over. Hales Gallery had one. I oh, think it was so from the good. '70s. It was mm -hmm. like a comb. Was yeah, it a comb painting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Wow. To me, I, I love his portals, um, and then I also love uh, Notes from the Woodshed. I don't know if you've read it, but um, it's this compilation of a lot of his notes. Uh, and the, the idea of the woodshed really—that book really changed my way of thinking. Actually, during the pandemic, um, about a studio practice and having kind of a side practice to allow yourself to play and do things that you don't think you'll show, or um, you know, have other types of projects that are going. So the woodshed is this, you know, jazz reference that a lot of people will make music in this way, but they're not sharing it, they're not performing for an audience, and it's like a safer space for you to create and play and fail and do a lot of weird things. But, um, but yeah, his painting practice, specifically his paintings, really, really influenced me even before reading Notes from the Woodshed. So definitely Jack Whitten. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank Devin, you. that was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing Thank everything. You.